Hello. My name is Ken Catandella. I'm the Senior Executive Director of the CAA and University Relations. We are really glad you all joined us today. Tonight, I am super excited because we've got members of the BioBus team, all with Columbia Connections, here for a really special hour. Before I introduce them, I just want to say, as a trustee of a charter school in Harlem, Harlem Link, I'm a huge fan of the BioBus. Three years ago, I started bringing the BioBus to Harlem Link, and it was so exciting for our students that we've started doing it twice a year. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the entire BioBus team for what they've done to give access to STEM during school closures. All of our Harlem Link families look forward to the weekly uh, science challenge. Now on to the introductions. So Rob Frawley is a 2010 graduate of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And he'll do the main presentation, but before he does, I would like to welcome Ben Dugan Thaler, the founder and executive director of BioBus, who's gonna tell us about BioBus, its programs, and its mission. Dr. Ben, as he's known to students, is a, 20, a 2000 graduate of the college, and ready for this? has a master's, an MPhil, and a PhD in biological sciences from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Near the end of the program, you'll, we'll have audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A button uh, on the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can with the time we have. Now, I'm really pleased to welcome Dr. Ben to Columbia at Home. Hello, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, again, my name is Ben dubin Thaler. I'm the founder and executive director of BioBus. Um, really excited to be here, and I wanted to tell a little bit of a story about my journey with BioBus. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and show you some slides real quick. Um, so give me a second. So this is a picture of um, the BioBus. This is back in 2008, right after I finished school. Um, and I went out and I bought an old bus and Columbia was a supporter from day one. Um, they saw my vision of making the scientific community more inclusive um, for uh, people of all different skin colors and people from all different backgrounds. And that's the whole uh, vision of BioBus is that everybody can get excited about science and do science. And my dream started with an old bus. This is the bio bus in the early days with peeling paint and all sorts of, you know, troubles. But the idea um, I was so excited about and, and other people got really excited about it. And what I wanted to tell you all is that if you have an idea that you think is a really good idea, um, try it. Get out there and try it. Um, and see um, if, you can, if you can make it work. That's what I did with BioBus. And um, I'm really lucky to, um, that idea really took off. This is a picture from just two years ago. This is um, uh, our newest BioBus, again, on College Walk on Columbia's campus um, as part of um, the Columbia Alumni STEM Day. Um, and Rob, who you'll be hearing from in a, in a few minutes, is right back here uh, uh, behind the bus. And um, we um, not only bring the bus to Columbia campus, but we also partner with Columbia. This is um, one of our mobile labs in front of uh, the Jerome L. Green Science Center, part of Columbia's newest Manhattanville campus. And BioBus has a science lab in the ground floor of the Jerome L. Green Science Center. And that's where um, uh, we do a lot of experiments with students like you. Um, and once this whole pandemic is over, um, we're really excited to get you on board the bus, uh, whether it's at your school or whether it's on campus or whether it's you coming to Manhattanville to BioBase Harlem and working with us on experiments. 
Now, I want to say a couple more ideas about what you should do if you have a really good idea and want to make it happen. Um, one of the most important things is get your friends involved. Um, this is a picture of one of my er one of the first scientists who joined me um, to try to make Biobus a big thing. Uh, her name is Latasha Wright, um, and she's a scientist um, that um, really made Biobus take off um, with me. So that's one lesson: is get your friends involved, get your community involved. Um, uh, you can't do anything that's worth doing, any any big idea that um, you hope that is going to have a, a big impact. You know, it's not just going to be yourself. You got to get other people around you excited about it. The second thing I want to say is that um, uh, you're going to hit potholes, so to speak. You're going to hit. Um, you're going to you're going to you're going to run into problems. This is a picture of the bus. Um, I was driving the bus, and the bus broke in the middle of the highway in the middle of the night. And I was so sad. It was probably one of the most sad moments of my entire life. Um, but um, whenever you're trying to do something, uh, there's gonna be moments like this. Um, and I'm here to just say, to encourage you, uh, keep going, right? Pick yourself up, learn from your mistakes. Um, and you might make another mistake, but eventually you'll get there. And also, it's so important, again, to have friends who are going to help you. Because when I was stuck on the side of the road, I put a call out to all my friends and I said, help, I need help, I'm stuck. And so many people came to, to my assistance because they believed in the idea and they didn't want to see Biobus uh, fail. Um, so um, uh, uh, if you want to do science with us, um, go to our website, it's biobus.org. Like Ken said, we're doing weekly explored home challenges. We're doing weekly student science town halls. And you can also sign up for free live science classes with me and Rob and Paul and our other scientists. So with that, uh, thank you again for joining us. And uh, next, uh, you're gonna get to meet Rob, one of the Biobus scientists. Hi everyone. So it's uh, great to meet everyone and great to be here uh, to talk about what I've done with Biobus and actually the path that got me there. Um, so I'm also going to briefly, or I'm going to share a few slides to help me kind of walk through what we're going to be looking at today. Um, and it's really, I want to tell you the story of becoming a community scientist. And so community scientist is the title that we scientists at Biobus have. Uh, and there's an intentionality behind that. It's because we're not scientists just working in the lab. We are scientists that bring the lab to the community. Um, and more importantly, we have the opportunity to bring the community into our labs. Uh, and so some of the classes that we held, this is a picture from the Jerome L. Green building in the new Manhattanville campus with some of our community partners in West Harlem um, using scientific equipment. Here we're, we're pHing um, fluids as part of a plant experiment. These are the kinds of things that I wanna celebrate um, in this presentation and why, why I chose to do this and how I got the ability and, and the, the privilege of getting this uh, position. But uh, before we start, I wanna actually launch a poll. And so uh, this is something that we do a lot at Biobus. We believe in student voice. Um, and so I think you should all see it now in Zoom. Uh, there's this poll that asks you, vote for whichever you'd like to see. Uh, which specimen you'd like to see under the microscope at the end. And by the end, whoever, or whichever of these choices has the most, um, I will, I promise, put it up on this screen using this laboratory microscope that I use to teach classes. Um, and I don't want to sway things in any way, but there is a clear leader after about six seconds. So we'll, we'll see what happens by the end of the talk. I am very excited uh, to see where this goes. Um, but this is, this is a practice we do at Biobus of just figuring out what students want to learn. Um, which I think you'll find makes you very invested in what you get to hear about. Um, so I'll talk about a few other things that we practice at Biobus to try to make education more of a conversation. Um, but for education, I should tell you about mine. Uh, I started at Columbia. So I did my undergraduate work at Columbia. Um, I graduated in the class of 2010 in what was then a young department of biomedical engineering. They just celebrated their 20th uh, anniversary this spring. Um, so very excited to see that department growing uh, and really becoming a, a leader in the field. Uh, and I always like to show this picture because this is the beautiful South Lawns and the campus. And for, for the liberal arts alumni and families, you may not venture back to mud very often. 
uh, or the biomedical engineering department, which um, doesn't have a lot of windows on the third floor of MUD, but that's where, that's where I, my love of science really kind of grew and blossomed. Um, while on campus, I had other interests, uh, also subterranean. So I like to spend time underground, it turns out, because I was an athlete at Columbia and I swam on the swim team, four stories underground uh, in Dodge Fitness Center. So I spent most of my life on the north end of the campus, walking between the engineering building and the swimming pool, um, wishing that I could sleep more. Uh, but those years were incredibly rewarding. Um, what I won't tell you much about today is that I still uh, am involved in the sport of swimming and Columbia swimming. So um, I, I do like to work with the team. I was a volunteer assistant in, under, uh, in my graduate work. Uh, so I got to travel with the team. Uh, and it's really an incredible group of guys that still uh, practice and train hard and are really achieving incredible feats in the water. And I, I would just say that um, while you chase your passion, it's always good to have, uh, always good to have something on the side to help you relax, uh, to kind of keep your mind and body healthy. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am as a community scientist, which is a, a career title. It's a job that most people don't hear, a community scientist, and then what it was like getting here. Uh, and I, I think that this is a misconception that some children and some students have that you step down a path and there's a very clear set of steps to get from where you are to where you want to be. Um, and that's your expected career path. And what I hope to show you is that uh, career paths are rarely so simple, that it's very hard to get from point A to point B, and that it's okay to take uh, not just wrong turns, but to spin around in circles for a little bit, uh, and then get your bearings and move forward. So when I finished Columbia, I knew I liked science. So the next logical step was I should do research. I applied to graduate programs, and I was actually accepted into a research program um, across the city, um, with Weill Cornell. And so I switched over to Cornell for grad school, but I still remember coached with Columbia, so my heart was in the right place. Uh, but in, in my graduate work, I worked on orthopedics and the science of bones and joints. And specifically, I worked on this set of bones in the human spine. Uh, so I was really interested in figuring out the mechanisms through which uh, people got sick, how your spine could deteriorate, um, how spinal conditions caused a great deal of pain. And I really worked on the tissue, the cells that keep this little sponge alive. So many adults will know your, your intervertebral or the between the vertebra discs. Um, they're the shock absorbers of the body. They let you bend and they let you um, basically articulate or move all around. That's why we're not uh, straight up like tree trunks, but they can degrade. And there are a few therapeutic ways uh, doctors can help people who have problems with these tissues. And my project was trying to figure out if I could uh, make these cells behave like bone um, using cell and tissue engineering. Uh, and another way to say that is, could I make a cartilage cell behave like a bone cell? Could I take a cell from one part of the body that has our DNA and convince it to behave like a cell in another part of our body? Uh, and I spent, about six years trying to answer this question. Um, could I do it? Um, and I'm not going to bore you. This is not a research talk. Um, and I don't want to tell you uh, how we did this. The short answer is you can kind of do it. <laughs> and, um, and it's a really good uh, hypothetical question. It's a really good scientific question to pursue. What genes, which pieces of your DNA are important for being cartilage, how you can turn some of them down, turn other genes up, um, how you can manipulate cells to behave in different ways uh, that might be useful for therapeutics, that might be less invasive and, and save people time or money or pain. Um, but by the end of my project, we had decided that my exact way of doing it wasn't going to work, that it wasn't going to be something that would ever be used in humans for therapy. Um, and the lab moved on to other ideas. Um, and th that was one of the reasons that uh, while it was a successful project, even, even a negative result is successful if you can prove it. Right, if you know that this is something that won't work. Uh, we learned a lot of information, uh, but that was one of the reasons that I decided that maybe research wasn't going to be my lifelong career. So even when I was working on that project, I started to look elsewhere. And the second thing I thought about was, well, maybe I should do science communication. Maybe I can talk, like I like talking, so maybe I could do that for a career. And I could tell people about science. I could tell people why I'm excited about science and I could translate my excitement into classrooms to teachers that don't have 
um, lab equipment, the teachers that are interested to hear a scientist talk. Um, so while Cornell doesn't have an undergraduate, uh, there's no college there, that's up in Ithaca. And so what I wound up doing was trying to find other ways to teach while I was in graduate school. So I became an adjunct professor uh, at Marymount Manhattan College. And I, in fact, still am. I teach a night class there. Um, and I included this image at the bottom because I was given the opportunity to choose what I wanted to teach. Um, and I chose a class in microbiology and infectious diseases. And this was back in 2015, 2016, right at the tail end of the global Ebola outbreak, or the, I should say the West African Ebola outbreak, which became a global news story. Um, and so I studied infectious diseases in order to teach that to undergraduates. Uh, epidemiology, the spread of infectious diseases and infectious agents, um, something that um, our moderator later will know a lot about. And I'm excited to say that I, I got to know this topic very well by teaching it to students and by following student curiosity on the college level. Uh, so this was good. This reinforced the idea that I like teaching and I, I could teach. Uh, so I sought other ways to teach. And actually, that was when I started volunteering at Rockefeller University with their science outreach programs, which was right by where Wild Cornell is. I started uh, talking to friends who are teachers. And I actually, my first uh, experience in New York City schools was in uh, Brooklyn High School of the Arts here, um, where I went and I taught a class about my work, about genetic engineering to ninth and 10th graders, that my friend was their teacher. Uh, and that really kind of cemented for me that I wanted to teach in schools in New York City. Uh, and then finally, I stumbled upon Biobus, uh, which we'll, we'll get back to again in a second. And as you by now know, that's where I've wound up. Uh, but so I started trying all of these different avenues of teaching, teaching with different groups, teaching uh, in classrooms just with my friends, and teaching through Biobus, uh, which at the time uh, had not uh, we had not moved into Columbia yet, so we were working mostly on the Lower East Side. Uh, we didn't have our new space. Uh, but I also wasn't sure, right? This was a, 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 what I would say, this is a career that I didn't know a lot of people in, and I wasn't sure that it could be a career that would sustain me, that I would be a, a full-time job. So I thought, well, I could do some other stuff. I'm good at writing. Um, and writing became uh, kind of what I thought I would do. That was the career I was preparing for at the end of graduate school. Um, so I started building a portfolio, writing things. I would attend science conferences and talks and I started a blog. It's not a very good blog. I made kind of punny titles and I wrote about science and I encourage you not to go check it out, <laughs> but it, it demonstrated at least that I could write and, and uh, I, you know, I credit my liberal arts education uh, and being able to piece together sentences about science in a, in a way that interested people. Um, some of that writing got me a, uh, uh, a conditional job. I worked freelance uh, with the New York Academy of Science, and I actually did their e-briefings on some of their meetings. Um, and that was really exciting. I got to write about topics that I didn't study, that I didn't know very well. Um, then I started to get really interested in writing. Uh, I got experimental. I tried to write a children's book about math, um, which is a clear copyright infringement, and I realized that I can't do that. But I wrote it for some friends' kids, and they really enjoyed learning about pi in this format. I got to flex my creativity. Uh, and even in this point, I was thinking I could be a communicator and I started a podcast about trivia that talks about science for a, a more adult audience, um, science and history. And these are all things that I use to kind of uh, flex my creative muscles. Um, and what, what it really turned out was that throughout grad school, I had no idea what direction I was going. My project kept changing. Um, and ultimately at the very end, only then did it become clear that I wanted to teach in schools with a company like Biobus. Um, and so the reality of finding a career is that it's never what you think. There will be a lot of challenges, like Ben mentioned earlier, things that will get you disappointed, things that may make you sad. Uh, but if you know what you want to do, if you know who you are, uh, you'll kind of find your way through. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think that that's a great moral. And I certainly don't think that, that I'm done either. I, I can't pretend that I've reached like any finish line. There's a lot to go. Um, but that's the mentality that I try to keep, that every twist and turn uh, is going to lead to a positive new direction. And then the direction that I've been in for the last three years has been working at Biobus. And so for the rest of my time, I want to tell you about what we do a little bit more. Um, so uh, a quote from our organization is that students are hungry for these opportunities. So we provide laboratory spaces. Uh, mobile accessible labs uh, to the students of New York City. 
this again is our space in the Jerome Green Building uh, up in Manhattanville uh, with a group of students who are doing a neuroscience project, uh, all gathered around the computer to see how their neuroscience model turned out. Um, but our, our programs take a lot of shapes and forms. Um, so one is the BioBus, which Ben has already showed you. Uh, on board, we have a number of microscopes, and these are uh, dissecting microscopes. They have HD cameras and images on the screens, uh, and students of all ages, from kindergarten through high school, uh, they use these microscopes. And it's a really empowering moment when you can focus and zoom and control what's on the screen to pursue your own interests, to see something that you've never seen before. Uh, there's a real, there's a, a light bulb that turns on. You can see it in students' eyes. When they have the power to say, what's that? I want to see it more closely. I'm going to zoom in. Uh, and delivering that moment is one of the best parts of our job. Uh, we also, again, uh, are up at this, this slide is not redundant, but we're up in the Manhattanville campus in the Jerome Green Building underneath seven floors of neuroscience researchers. So we have the opportunity to collaborate with labs um, that are studying the brain. And they can give us occasionally samples, images, uh, or they can come speak with our students. And this is a tremendous privilege to be able to give to our students. Uh, and we try to bring as many of our community partners and partner schools into the space to meet those scientists. Um, and in these labs, they're able to do all kinds of experiments, uh, sampling water, we do ecology, neuroscience, uh, we do all kinds of chemistry that's lab safe uh, under the guise, uh, under the supervision of our interns, you can see here in green shirts, and I'll tell you more about, and our scientists. Um, so a full list of what we do can take a while. We visit schools in the biobus, up to two a day. We have uh, visits to our base where schools come. We have after-school groups come to our bio base. Uh, we host weekend lab classes throughout the year. We have after-school programs at schools. Uh, we host open science events, like our Saturday Science Series with the Zuckerman Institute. Uh, and we mentor research interns. And I want to tell you a little bit about that because that's the part um, that, that really we invest a lot of time into working with students uh, for over hundreds of hours, several hundred hours a year uh, on a research project, just like being in the lab. Um, so one research project I want to show you features uh, Vanessa Quata, Leah Grossman, and their mentor, Dr. Latasha Wright, seen here. Um, and this is them presenting their work at the Museum of Natural History. Uh, so Vanessa and Leia were interns with us last year. Vanessa is actually back this summer doing work remotely. She's an undergrad now. Um, but their research was based on neuroscience work that's done in the Zuckerman Institute. Um, and so they studied fruit fly behavior. And you might know fruit flies as the animals that get into your bananas when they get overripe. Uh, but working with Dr. Barbara Noro, Vanessa and Leia uh, developed their own project and they were able to ask a question. Um, they asked if mutant fruit flies will behave differently around ethanol uh, and banana infused ethanol compared to normal fruit flies. So they set up a kind of uh, traditional mutation experiment given two choices. What will the fly's behavior be? Uh, and they were able to study this rigorously and they actually found some results that uh, future interns were supposed to be continuing this year until we had to go remote. Uh, but they were results that we didn't necessarily expect and we were very excited about. Um, and so we'll tell you a little bit, um, well, we'll just tell you that about the work that uh, Leah and Vanessa did, uh, but that it led to new findings that the lab is still keeping in mind. Um, but this year we had to go virtual. So the last thing I want to mention is how we went virtual um, with remote microscope classes for every grade, uh, remote weekly session, sessions for our community partners, like Ken mentioned earlier, weekly science challenges that everyone is welcome to do. There are videos posted on our websites. Uh, intern sessions, we still meet with our interns and they're working on video projects and developing a library online of games for students. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to tell you about was about our town halls. And so I have just one clip that I wanted to show you. Uh, and it's about five minutes long. So I just want to run this here. But this was a town hall that I participated in. It's very similar, I think, to an event like this where we're able to hear from the community, they ask questions and we answer them directly. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over in this video clip um, to, oh, and actually let me make sure the audio is going to share properly. Uh, let me hand it over to Dr. Tiffany King Peoples of Biobus, who is our host for this town hall. Hi, hi everyone. I'm Dr. Tiffany, I'm a scientist. And as Marina said, I'll be your host today. So I'm gonna to tell you just a little bit about my background um, and then we'll get started. 
after studying to become a scientist, I actually taught on the bio bus and at the bio base for two years. I loved teaching students like you guys how to think about science and how to make discoveries. I'm equally as passionate about making new discoveries of my own um, in cancer treatments. So now I'm a scientist at the University of Pennsylvania where I make living cancer therapies using human cells. The type of cells that we use are white blood cells. And the way it works is we take white blood cells out of patients and we change their DNA in the lab in order to make them better recognize and kill tumor cells when they see them again. And what I mean by seeing them again is that other doctors will then take those cells and put them back into the patient. And then those are living therapies. <laughs> now I'd like to introduce you guys to our two scientists who will be answering your questions today. Dr. Puel and Dr. Rob, could you each tell us a little about yourselves? My name is Dr. Puel. Uh, much like Tiffany, um, after I finished uh, studying to be a scientist, I realized I wanted to have my very own lab where I could answer the questions that I was really interested in. And for me, I love skin, everything to do with our skin and hair. So in particular, what I study is so if you get a cut, like on your knee or on your foot, and there are some people, for example, people who have very advanced diabetes, they can have these cuts that don't heal for a very, very long time. So my research looks at what's wrong with the cuts that don't heal for a very long time and how can we make them faster? And hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Rob. Um, I studied to be an engineer at Columbia University. Um, and I thought I was going to be the kind of person who built cars and spaceships, but I actually learned that one of the best challenges for an engineer was trying to learn how the body works and how to fix it. So it was there that I got interested in studying bones uh, in a field called orthopedics, which is the medical science of your bones and joints. Um, Brandon, who's 11, asks, where are the most dense bones located? Most bones in our body are actually, they're kind of hollow. So you can think about bones being shaped like a roll of, of paper towels that around the outside, they have this thick, hard part that protects them. But on the inside, you might have things like bone marrow and you have uh, spongy structures. This is why we're not so dense that we sink. Like that kind of lightness allows us to move around and run and swim and be quick. But the densest bones in our body, kind of like this outer layer, that's in our skull, in our, the bone that's called the calvaria, the bald bone in our body. And there's one really dense bone, like kind of right at the bottom. It's called like, I believe the temporal bone. There's one part of that that is the densest bone in your body. And its job is to hold and support and protect your brain. And there is no gaps. It's just a solid piece of bone. Uh, so that, that's the densest you'll ever be. So All right, Marina. Um, how about one last question from the chat? Um, okay, so we had a question that was submitted before, and that question was from Robin, who is 10 years old, and he wanted to know if you get chills when you see skin and bone. And then Bella from the chat asked, why do you, what made you want to do what you do? So I think that those two go nice hand in hand, because sometimes looking at bones and skin can be a little creepy. So. Um, it, it would be nice to understand why Rob and Puel, Dr. Rob and Dr. Puel, uh, went into those fields. So I, I can go first and just say, um, luckily I don't get chills when I see skin and bones. It would have made it very hard to do my research when I was in lab. Um, I see pictures of skin and bones and I get kind of excited. Like this is a, an anatomy book and this is a skeleton of a frog. And I look at this and I'm really excited by it. it. It shows me like the relationship of bones and a living thing and how they work. And I'm like, that's cool. I want to learn about it. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, I thought I was going to build airplanes and spaceships. And when I was in college and I started seeing pictures like this, and instead of thinking about, okay, well, how do you build a spaceship? How, how do these bones work? And how do they support now? How does a frog jump as high as it does? Like, what's the kind of force? Like, how do you... How do you fix it if it breaks? Uh, those are the questions that got me really excited. And so I realized that I wanted to think about engineering problems, but about the human body and about the bodies of living things. And so um, there were some moments when I had to do research where you, know, you have to study animals and it can be a little gross, 
Um, but you, I think if you're excited enough by the question you're asking, it's never a problem. Okay, so uh, that, that's everything I had to present. Again, I really wanted to show that clip of our town hall uh, because it does demonstrate how much we value student voice, letting students ask their own questions, and then giving them a direct line to experts, like Dr. Puel, who's currently working at NYU Medicine at Langone to understand skin, myself, and we've had one of these events a week uh, for the last 10 or nine weeks. And so uh, we're really thrilled to be able to give students this forum to ask questions. Um, and hopefully that's what will happen now. So I believe uh, it's time for me to uh, start taking questions from the crowd here. Um, and to do that, I want to call upon the help of my, my friend and one of the interns at Biobus, Paul Ajayi. Uh, and so Paul, is, he's been an intern with us at Biobus for the last year. Uh, he's a graduate of Montclair State University, and he is uh, wonderfully, he is an incoming graduate student at the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia. And so, Paul, I'm going to ask you to help us uh, get questions out of the chat today. Of course. Hi, everyone. That was wonderful, Dr. Rob. Thank you so much for sharing and all that you do for BioBus as a proud alumnus of Columbia. Uh, and we have a few questions coming in from our wonderful audience. Uh, don't forget to use the Q&A button on Zoom. We have one from Kumi, uh, and she asked, uh, what is the book that impacted you the most as a human being or as a scientist? Wow, the book that impacted me the most. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a hard question because I definitely read a lot. Um, and uh, let's see, I, uh, I definitely remember reading A Wrinkle in Time when I was very young. And that was a book that kind of, it showed me different ways of thinking. Uh, at that point in my life, I don't think I had uh, a taken into account. So I, I absolutely loved A Wrinkle in Time um, and I still think about it. Uh, so that, that might be it. That, like, that might be the book that had the single biggest effect um, early on. Wow. Yeah, and I, I, wow, that is, that is a wonderful question and I wish yeah. I had a better answer or a more readily confident answer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Kimi, and thanks, Rob. Uh, we have another question from Paul Hayes. Uh, hi, I'm Paul too, hello. Uh, and um, Paul asks, what do you do to foster a relationship between teachers, mentors, and students that inspire students to learn? That's such a great question. Um, and it's really at the key of education and what, what we try to do with BioBus. So the relationship between teachers uh, and their students, uh, it, it, it really determines the success of students. Um, student, student success is kind of uh, all other things uh, taken out. The, the, the relationship they have with their teacher, the trust that they have in their classroom environment uh, is one of the best predictors of success. Um, and I think that, uh, the way that we work with students, that we try to give voice to students, uh, to try to say that your opinion matters, that what you have to say matters, that what, what you're thinking, even if you don't know if it's right or you don't know if it's good enough, like it's worth saying and it's worth hearing. Um, th those are the kinds of lessons that we try to work with um, and, and all ages of students, but especially with interns, uh, with, with students coming of age and trying to grapple with um, their scientific selves, their, their identity as a scientist, uh, whether or not they can even be a scientist. That's something that a lot of students that we work with in schools in New York, um, there's a, a predisposed idea that they're not the person to be a scientist. Um, and if we can dispel that idea and say, you could be a scientist, like all you need to do is think about it this way or have the confidence to ask these questions. Um, so I would describe a lot of it to uh, having a, a positive reinforcement uh, between students and their teachers, that teachers uh, are a resource that students can turn to. And that's what we as mentors always try to be. Right, right. And, and also to add on to that, I think um, even at working as an intern at BioBus, we, you know, we're trying, we, we try our best to show um, our students and our interns that, you know, that you matter, you know, in STEM and you value, we value you as well and we hear you. Um, so I'm really grateful to be part of a great organization of BioBus. So yeah, shout out to Ben and Rob. So thank you both. Thank you, uh, We have another question uh, from Lori Faye Fischler. Um, who asks, how do you get a 13 year old excited to learn to, to learn and understand failure um, as a tool and not as a reason to stop? Ooh, yeah, that, I mean, 
you could reframe that question to how do you teach a 24 year old graduate student to accept failure and not stop it it's it's a it's a question that you will have i think for the rest of your life um failure is not the end uh failure is not a stopping point um many failures feel uh terminal and you know this if you've done research you know this if you've um, ever tried uh, if you tried your hand at anything at, at sports at games um, at you know I don't know like any any hobby you do you may fail in um, science is no different the only difference is that science failure gives you information um, failure gives you something to build on a new direction to move in um, so one problem that I think the entire field of science has is the uh, the rejection of failure um, and so we talk about how negative results don't get published, right? New drugs that find amazing cancer therapies, they get published, but the studies that don't go as well, we don't hear about, but there's just as much information. Um, so part of it is a systemic issue of just dealing with what a failure actually means. Um, and in terms of getting excited about science, I think uh, being able to ask risky questions is always more exciting. And the reason we don't do it is because we're afraid of failure. Um, so if you get to ask riskier questions, if you get to, you know, most students come into our laboratory and we say, what do you want to look at under a microscope? And they'll pick one of the most, you know, they want to look at uh, a rhinoceros. They want to look at uh, a dolphin. And those are things that are very hard to do with, what, with our conditions, but they're not ridiculous ideas, right? They're not things that you shouldn't pursue just because it's impossible here and impossible now. And hopefully there's like young zoologists coming out of these programs that feel empowered to do things like that. Um, so I think to be excited about science, you have to find what in science excites you um, and th then you can follow your interest. And I know that's a really hard advice to give, especially for teachers, um, because they have curriculum to get through. But um, yeah, if, if, if you can find a way to let students find what interests them, uh, we find that it just, it leads to better projects for research and it leads to better, uh, it leads to better associations with science. Thank you so much, Rob. And uh, to add on to that, as like a former, you know, college student, um, I experienced a lot of failures, um, even as a bio major. Um, but I think the point, the one thing I learned from failures is that it makes you resilient um, and it makes you learn um, throughout, during the process as well. So um, I will actually like to ask the same question to Ben, because uh, I think you mentioned how you experienced failure yourself as well, but how has that helped you um, as well too? Yeah. Well, you know, one of my professors actually in the biology department is named Stuart Firestein, and he's a neuroscientist, and he wrote an entire book about, and the title of that book is Failure. Um, and, um, you know, one of the points that he makes is, is, is the same point that, that Rob makes, is that, um, you know, some of, the, some of the best scientific experiments you know the results you know were you know came originally from 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 massive failures um and and then the important thing is that you learn right you learn from your failures um and and it's just so true that you fail 99 times and then the 100th time you succeed that's the only thing that anybody ever hears about Right, which is why we have such a bias towards this idea that we can't fail because we don't realize that everybody around us who we think is so successful, they failed 99 times for every one time that they were successful. And the same is absolutely true for me. And I think it's, I think everybody who, uh, you know, you know, thinks about it and reflects on that, you know, will probably agree that it's, it's true for you too. Um, so I think that's a big part of not getting too down on yourself when you fail, just remembering that, you know, Einstein, the smartest scientist, arguably, you know, in the history, you know, of, 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 you know, humankind, right, failed for years and years and years and was so frustrated because he couldn't figure out how to get the equations to work, right? Even he failed 99 times before he finally succeeded. So keep that in mind. It'll make you feel better when you fail again and again and again. Yes. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Heather, uh, who asked, uh, what can a middle schooler do during this crazy summer to study science on his or her own? So I pose this question to both of you. Ooh. 
Can, can you repeat that one more time for me? Of course. Uh, what, ca what can a middle schooler do during this crazy summer mm. to study science on his or her own? Okay. Um, there are, so I think we, we're at a point now where we've all exhausted uh, a lot of the internet resources that we think are out there. Um, I know BioBus has a collection of resources. Actually, for middle schoolers, we do have a library of papers written by scientists, but rewritten for middle school students. So you can check out our What's the BioBuzz articles. That's always fun. Um, for middle school students, it, it can be tricky. And I would say um, you can start looking in the world around you and maybe conducting experiments. Some of the Explorer at Home challenges we do are about just that, um, setting experiments with either um, bugs you find in the garden or starting to explore um, the way things are designed, uh, what happens if you grow plants in different conditions. So you can set little experiments and keep notes on them. Um, I like doing things like that. And there may also be um, kind of scientific uh, challenges online and scientific things that you can look through like science puzzles or science, uh, sci like not homework problems, but scientific problems to get you thinking um, and be thought provoking. So I, I would encourage looking for whatever resources you can find. There is a lot on the internet and it's hard to get through, uh, but you can find answers in your own backyard or down the street or around the corner if you, if you really look hard and, and ha hopefully have someone to kind of help guide you through it. Thank you so much, Rob. Ben? Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the things that, the things that, that, you know, the explore at home challenges, you know, go to biobus.org, you know, we have a lot of resources there. Um, and then, um, you know, I think, um, you know, coming up with, um, you know, coming up with things that you can observe if you're, especially if you're stuck at home and you're still stuck at home, right? Um, a lot of the things that are just right around us, right, can be such rich playgrounds. Um, you know, when you think about uh, cooking, right, and the science of cooking, there's some great books out there, and I can put some in the chat about food science and understanding the chemistry of food. Um, you know, baking is basically one big science experiment, one big controlled science experiment. Instead of beakers, you're using measuring cups, but, you know, it's, it's very similar. Um, so um, another example of things that you can do in your own home, um, for instance, you know, we, a lot of us are living in New York City, and even if you're not living in New York City, uh, I guarantee you have bugs inside of your house. Um, you know, whether those bugs might be cockroaches, or they might be ants, or they might be flies, or they might be spiders, right, looking for those creatures that you live with, even if you don't like to live with them all the time, right, collect them, and look at them under a magnifying glass, or maybe, um, you know, count how many different legs you know, how many legs does a fly have versus a spider and start to think about the different habitats mm -hmm. that are in your own house because there are a lot of them. Right. Right. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, we have an amazing question from David Miller. So this might be an earful. So um, David says, I am thinking of entering Columbia to become an aerospace scientist to develop the first manned main vehicle to land on Mars. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I am also thinking of studying medicine at Columbia. At, one po at what point in high school career or at Columbia must I make the decision to enter engineering or medicine at Columbia? So this is a loaded question, so mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, it's a wonderful question. Uh, and I, I, I think there's no right answer, which is the, don't, don't be annoyed by that. It's not a cop out, let me tell you why. Um, when I went to Columbia, I was in the engineering school and I thought that I was going to be an aerospace engineer. That was 100% what I thought I was gonna do. Build motors, I maybe built cars, but like airplanes would be cool. Airplanes was kind of what I was thinking. Um, so I started taking engineering courses, the, the mechanical engineering, which is the field that would do that, that first course conflicted with some other class that I had. So I took the closest thing that I could find, which was a biomechanics course um, that talked about heart valves and it talked about artificial hips and it talked about um, the interface of engineering and biology. Uh, and it was in that class that I really uh, had my mind changed that, that I could do the things I wanted to do, think about forces and, and design parts uh, while also thinking about the body and the problems of, of what happens in, in a heart that has a chamber that no longer pumps 
uh, were just as fascinating as the, the problems of telemetry and landing a vehicle on the moon. And uh, for me, it, it became something that I, I saw myself more interested in. Um, you may get to the same point and disagree and say, nope, I still want to land on Mars. Um, and so I think that that can always be, uh, to a certain degree, there's always an open door. Um, pursuing medicine, I don't think would ever disqualify you uh, from going into uh, like the field of astronomy or being an astronaut. Um, so I, I don't, I would say that as long as you can, can see a way forward, then it's never too late. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there, is, uh, there are points in your career you have to decide, do I want to be pre-med or not? Because if I'm not pre-med in undergrad, then I have to do a post back year. I have to do another year after college to make some of those classes up. But that's not a closed door. That's just, you know, that's, that's more time later because you can learn something else right now. Um, so I would check in with yourself. I would be honest with yourself about what you want to do this year and where that's going to get you. Um, but I mean, honestly, I mean, you can talk to Ben with his, how many degrees he has from Columbia. You can always go back to school <laughs> and, and you can always learn the next thing. And I'll, if I can add on to that, like I am someone who aspires to go into medicine too. And um, I know the great thing about, you know, wanting to work in aerospace and, you know, being medicine, um, I believe Dr. Mae Jemison, uh, she mm -hmm. African-American um, astronaut, um, she's also a physician as well. So it's endless and it's possible. Uh, so we have, we're going to wrap up in five minutes. So we have one question from Brittany Logan, um, and she asks, what do you feel is are the biggest issues today facing those engaged in science outreach? Um, what are suggestions to improve? Okay, so science outreach is, um, is the field that BioBus is in, uh, uh, delivering science, talking about science, making science accessible. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are a number of barriers that kind of come from different uh, from different parts of our job. Uh, and so one is that uh, we, we at BioBus work with uh, science education. So we do outreach with schools. Um, and so we work with uh, the education system and the Department of Education. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's no secret that, that there could be more funding in education. There could be more funding in educational programs um, and in, in schools uh, and that's always, uh, I mean, that's always something that we come across. Um, I think uh, issues with science outreach that are a little bit more particular to the individuals are that scientists work really hard on specific things. Um, and the art of outreach is kind of taking a complicated idea and communicating it in a way that more people can understand it. Um, it's very hard to step away from jargon and to step away from the specifics that scientists really, I mean, they, they spend their entire life like working on very minute problems. And then to be able to step back and say, in general terms, this is what I do and this is why it's important. I think there's a breakdown there. There's that, that, uh, that space between the expert and, and society uh, that's very hard to, to bridge with words sometimes. And so being able to uh, reliably talk about science in a way that is straightforward, uh, that's clear, that's not scary, and that's not wrong. Um, th those are challenges that we try to train ourselves in, um, to try to go through exercises to be clear, to speak at grade level, to speak uh, with vocabulary that's familiar. Um, so I think that might, uh, that might be something that we spend a lot of time that we have the power to fix in science outreach. Yes. Amazing. And we also do that with our interns too, like yes. with the whole one COVID-19 hit. Um, you know, we, uh, they, we gave them the opportunity to work on science communication projects and learn about jargon and learn how to um, read research articles. So science communication is really big. So yeah, we hope that when all our interns, those who become scientists will already have the communication down and they don't have to learn it as adults, like, like some other of us had to. <laughs> right, right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Ben and Rob for um, answering these questions. Uh, we also have a poll, right? That we yes. Answer. So I'm going to end the poll. It was a close race. So the, the options for those of you who either missed it or didn't see it, um, you can vote on the specimen you'd like to see under the microscope. There is a Madagascar hissing cockroach, uh, stained bones from a mouse knee. That was my thesis and it got just about the least votes. Uh, <laughs> uh, pond water microorganisms, a garden snail, but there's overwhelming support 
uh, for the mouse brain. So I am going to share this. I think everyone can see. These are our results. 33%, uh, no, sorry, 45% of our audience wanted to see a mouse brain. Um, and so I will briefly tell you that it looks like this. Um, so this is a mouse brain cells. Um, and let me get a white background here from one of my last classes. Um, so this is a slice of a brain. And I know someone was wondering in the Q&A about uh, how do we get slices of bone? How do we get slices of a brain? There's a machine that cuts very, very thin slices and then it allows us to add a dye. So a brain is not usually this color, but what we do is we add the dye and then um, this should work. Once I add uh, this slide to the microscope, it'll appear up on this big screen. Um, and all I have to do is get my brain in position. There we go, so that is the brain slice. And what I wanna show you by zooming in is that um, it is composed of, and I am right in front of it, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, these are some of the cells, and I'm gonna swing over this way. So these are the cells of a mouse's brain. They're stained black with a dye called a Golgi stain. Um, and the first scientist that really documented this, a scientist named Santiago Ramon y Cajal, he made beautiful hand-drawn ink images of these cells. Um, and you can really see the way that these brain cells, these neurons, reach out, they have little branches called dendrites, and that's how they send information. Um, and so one brain cell on its own, not super powerful. A hundred billion brain cells together firing electrical messages, that gets us. So um, this is just a small slice of a small piece of a mouse's brain um, died so that we can, died so that we can see it, but yeah, I think the, what I would say, the architecture, the, the, the way these cells interact is still largely a mystery. It's three-dimensional structure of a brain, um, really hard to describe, kind of beautiful to look at. Okay. So thank you everyone who voted in that poll. We had a really nice turnout. Um, and I would say that if you voted for one of the other options, um, snails, pond water, bones, uh, those are things that we do look at in all of our classes and sometimes in our town halls. So you can check out our BioBus programs and maybe you'll get a chance to see everything that was on that list. Okay. And, and I could do this all day, so <laughs> please, please tell me to stop if anyone wants to, but some really nice. Rob, there was one question about that sample that maybe you can answer, which is um, uh, Fataha Rahman asks, if, if the black parts are the cells, what are the white and gray parts of the brain? Which I, I also want to know the answer. Ooh, yeah. Um, so that's a wonderful question. You're totally right. These black parts are the cells and you can kind of see the long branches here in the middle. They're, they're extending down and down. Uh, so here it's nothing but cells, right? This is all dark. It's all interwoven and this is very, very thin. So this slice is actually what we say five micrometers, which is, um, oh, there are a few ways to talk about it. It's like the thickness of a soda can or it's, it's incredibly thin, um, thinner than a human hair. So some of the cells um, that aren't here, the gray is just an absence of cells, uh, but some of the cells are cut off, kind of going in and out. And actually with this particular stain, it doesn't stain every single brain cell. So some of the spaces are just other types of brain cells um, that we, we didn't stain black. So this, this is actually, because it only stains some of the cells, really lets us see the shape. If it stained all of them, then the whole brain would just be like a dark black uh, glob. Uh, so it's, it's convenient. They didn't know that that happened. That's a mistake. Actually, that was a failure. They wanted to make a stain that hit every single neuron, uh, but now we can use it to see these very well. Wow, that was amazing, guys. Absolutely amazing. I want to thank Rob, Dr. Ben, and most importantly, I want to thank the newest member of our Columbia community, uh, Paul, and we'll see you in the fall. Please visit alumni.columbia.edu for the latest on Columbia at home. And finally, all of you, stay healthy, stay safe, and stay interested in science. Have a good night.